Welcome to the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture is going to continue our series of Bitcoin lectures. We're going to dive into Bitcoin's version of mining and decentralized consensus. We're going to go through a number of different topics. We'll give an overview of mining. We'll talk about the reward, the incentives and rewards that are provided to miners. We'll talk about the process of verifying transactions in Bitcoin. We'll talk about Bitcoin uh, mining nodes and how they mine blocks. Then we will dive into the proof of work algorithm. Then we'll cover uh, how the decentralized consensus actually works and what happens when the network splits and essentially forks. Uh, then we'll dive into mining pools. And finally, we'll close with a discussion of hard forks and soft forks. So the purpose of mining is somewhat uh, misleading. Um, when we think about the word mining, we think about the gold miners in 1849. Uh, we think about the idea of, you know, putting a lot of effort into digging that gold out of the ground. Or in Bitcoin's case, we're thinking about all the electricity and all the machines that are necessary to mine new Bitcoins in each new block. However, although mining has uh, these rewards, uh, the primary purpose of mining is not the reward or the incentive, you know, these new Bitcoins. Instead, um, mining is the means to accomplish the goal of the process. So mining is an incentive mechanism that underpins our decentralized consensus by which transactions are validated and cleared. So mining is essentially an invention that makes Bitcoin special. It's a decentralized security mechanism that is the basis for our peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So we can say that mining secures the Bitcoin system and enables the emergence of a network-wide consensus without having to have a central authority uh, in our peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, the reward of newly minted coins and transaction fees is essentially an incentive scheme that aligns the actions of miners with the security of the network, while simultaneously implementing our monetary supply by creating new Bitcoin and providing them to the miners. So mining is essentially the mechanism what, by which Bitcoin security becomes decentralized. So miners validate new transactions and record them on the global ledger. A new block containing transactions uh, that have occurred since the last block is mined on average every 10 minutes, thereby adding those new transactions to the blockchain. Transactions that become part of a block and are added to the transaction are considered confirmed, which allows new owners of the Bitcoin to spend the Bitcoin they received in those transactions. The exception is for a Coinbase transaction, which we'll talk about later. Uh, for Coinbase transactions, when a miner is getting paid the incentive, they're not allowed to actually spend that those Bitcoins uh, for another 100 blocks, which basically means they need to wait to roughly the next day. So miners receive two types of rewards in return for the security provided by mining. Uh, the new coins created for each new block, which are referred to as a block reward or Coinbase reward, and transaction fees from all the transactions included in the block. Uh, to earn this reward, miners compete to solve a mathematical problem based on a cryptographic hash algorithm. The solution to that cryptographic hash algorithm is called the proof of work, and it's included in the new blocks uh, as proof that the miner expended the computing to solve that problem. Uh, the competition to solve the proof of work algorithm to earn the reward and the right to record transactions on the blockchain is the basis for Bitcoin's security model. So as I mentioned, miners receive these two types of rewards, the block reward and the transaction fees. Uh, the process is called mining because the reward new coin generation is designed to simulate diminishing returns, just like mining for precious metals. Bitcoin's mining supply 
is created through mining, similar to how a central bank issues new money by printing banknotes. The maximum amount of newly created Bitcoin a miner can add to a block decreases approximately every four years or every 210,000 blocks. Uh, originally in 2009, um, there were 50 Bitcoin issued in every block that halved to 25 Bitcoin in 2012. It halved to 12 and a half Bitcoin in 2016 and went down again to six and a quarter Bitcoin in 2020. Um, and it'll keep on decreasing uh, in, until approximately the year 2140 when all Bitcoin will have been issued. After 2140, no new Bitcoin will be issued. Bitcoin miners also receive fees from transactions. Every transaction usually includes a transaction fee in the form of the difference of the Bitcoin between the transactions inputs and outputs. Um, so for example, if your transaction has two Bitcoins going in and one Bitcoin coming out as an output, then that difference is one Bitcoin and that would be the mining fee. Um, typically transaction fees represent um, you know, a small amount of Bitcoin miners income. Uh, the winning Bitcoin miners essentially keeping all the change on the transactions, including the winning block. Um, today, if a Bitcoin mining fee is $10, I'm sorry, if a Bitcoin transaction fee is $10, and if there's 4,000 transactions in a block, that would mean um, that a miner would get $40,000 from the, those transaction fees. However, the miner also gets the six and a quarter Bitcoins, uh, which are each worth over $40,000 currently. So the miner is getting over 240,000 from the block reward and at most $40,000 from the transaction fees. So, you know, more than 80% of the income the miner gets is coming from the block reward and only a small amount is coming from the transaction fees. But as the block rewards decrease over time and the number of transactions per block increases, a greater proportion of Bitcoin mining earnings will come from fees. Uh, gradually, the mining reward will be dominated by transaction fees. By 2140, uh, miners won't be generating any new Bitcoins, but the mining will be coming only from transaction fees. Um, here's a quick look at um the supply of bitcoin currency over time and you can see the supply of bitcoin obviously increased rapidly uh from two, beginning of 2009 and obviously it's it started slowing over 2020 and it'll continue to slow until it hits its cap uh around 2140 or 2040. so deflation is a phenomenon of appreciation of value due to a mismatch in supply and demand that drives up the value. Uh, many economists argue that deflationary economy is a disaster that should be avoided at all costs. Um, however, uh, Bitcoin experts take the position that deflation is not bad per se, that deflation in Bitcoin is not caused by a collapse in demand, but by a constrained supply. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the deflation aspect of the Bitcoin currency is a problem or an advantage because of the protection from inflation. Um, the positive aspect of deflation, of course, is that it's the opposite of inflation. Inflation causes a slow uh, debasement of currency, resulting in a form of hidden taxation that punishes savers in order to bail out debtors. Currencies under government control suffer from the hazard, hazard of easy debt issuance that can later be erased through uh, debasement at, at the expense of currency savers. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is that the idea that Bitcoin is deflationary is in fact a theory. It hasn't actually proven that it's deflationary, uh, but it seems like a reasonable theory that is in fact deflationary. Um, Satoshi, Nak Satoshi Nakamoto's main invention uh, and his, is actually, from, from a Bitcoin perspective, is his decentralized mechanism for achieving decentralized consensus. Uh, and we can refer to this as an emergent consensus. Um, you know, 
because consensus is not achieved explicitly. There's no election or fixed moment when consensus occurs. Instead, consensus is an emergent ar artifact of the asynchronous interaction of thousands of independent nodes, all following simple rules. All the properties of Bitcoin, including currency, transactions, payments, and the security model that don't depend on central authority or trust derive from this invention of decentralized consensus. This is essentially how everyone in the network agrees on a single universal truth about who owns what without having to trust everyone. All the traditional payment systems depended on a trust model that had a central authority providing a clearinghouse service, basically verifying and clearing all the transactions. Bitcoin, however, has no central authority, yet somehow every full node has this complete copy of the public ledger that it can trust as the authoritative uh, record that is based on this emergent consensus that enables everyone to act on the information that's been transmitted across the network and to arrive at the same conclusions and assemble their identical copy of the public ledger. So Bitcoin's decentralized consensus emerges from the interplay of four processes that occur independently on nodes across the network. Um, and these four are critical to how Bitcoin uh, works. The first of the four is independent verification of each transaction by every full node based on a comprehensive list of criteria. So basically the nodes are sending um, the transactions and each node will independently verify that transaction based on a checklist and determine whether or not it's valid. And if it's valid, then they will propagate it on to other nodes. Uh, if it's not valid, obviously they will not prop send it on. Um, the next step is independent aggregation of those transactions into new blocks by mining nodes, coupled with a demonstrated computation through a proof of work algorithm. So this is the mining process where the mining nodes will take transactions out of the transaction pool and create a candidate block and, uh, and then attempt to solve the proof of work computation. The third step is independent verification of the new blocks by every node and assembly into a chain. So once a node solved the proof of work uh, concept and came up with a solution, it then broadcasts the nodes to its the, the solution to its neighbors, and those neighbors are now verifying the blocks and, uh, before they assemble it into their blockchain. And then the fourth step is independent selection by every node of the chain with the most cum cumulative computation demonstrated through proof of work. Um, and this is really dealing with what happens if we have multiple chains or multiple blocks that are simultaneously solved through the proof of work solution. This is how our approach to deciding which block um, should be included in the blockchain by looking at the most cumulative computation through proof of work to determine which chain is the longest chain and therefore the valid chain. So these four steps are really what create Bitcoin's decentralized consensus. So we're gonna dive into each of these steps in more detail. So let's talk about the independent verification of transactions. Um, before a transaction is forwarded from one node to the next, every Bitcoin node that receives a transaction is first gonna verify the transaction. This ensures that only valid transactions are sent across the network, while invalid transactions are discarded as soon as they're encountered. So each node verifies each transaction against a long list of criteria. First, they're checking to see if the transaction syntax and data structure is correct. Then they're verifying that uh, the list of inputs or outputs are not empty. You know, a transaction has to have inputs and it has to have outputs. Um, they're ver the next step to verify is the transaction size is less than the maximum size allowed. Um, the next step is that each output value must be within the allowed range of values. Um, then they check to make sure that um, it's not a Coinbase transaction. Um, then they check because uh, Coinbase transactions are only being relayed as part of a block. They're not relayed as, as, as a separate transaction. Um, then we check to make sure that um, some of the other variables like lock time and sequence values are in the correct uh, numbers range that they have available. Um, check the transaction size in bytes is greater than a minimum number. Um, check the number of signature operations is less than the number of signatures maximum. 
Um, check to make sure that the scripts uh, match um, some of the requirements on scripts. Check to make sure that, um, you know, if you're spending a transaction, you know, that there is actually a transaction in the transaction pool or a block in the branch. Um, for each input, if the reference output exists in any other transaction in the pool, the transaction must be rejected. This is a, a test to make sure that um, there hasn't been a double, this is not a double spend attempt. Uh, for each input, look in the main branch of the transaction pool to, to find the parent transaction of this transaction. Um, for each input, if the parent transaction is a Coinbase transaction, we want to confirm that that Coinbase transaction took place over 100 blocks ago um, because uh, miners have to wait uh, 100 blocks or almost a day before they can spend their Bitcoin. Uh, for each input, the reference output must exist and cannot already be spent. Um, again, uh, check to make sure that there isn't a, this is not a double spending attempt. Um, then we check that um, the parent transactions input values are in the allowed range of values. Uh, we reject if the sum of input values is less than the sum of output values. You know, if you're spending one Bitcoin, you don't get two Bitcoin back uh, in change. Um, then we check reject if the transaction fee is too low to get into a block. Um, generally, miners will have a minimum transaction fee they're looking for. Um, we'll look at the unlocking scripts to verify that they validate against the corresponding locking scripts. Uh, this, again, this is for your input transactions. And it basically, we're checking to make sure that you sign the check to spend those Bitcoin. So these conditions can be seen in detail um, in several functions in Bitcoin Core. Note that the condition list checklist we just saw changes over time to address new types of uh, attacks or sometimes to relax the rules to include more types of transactions. Uh, but the important thing is by independently verifying each transaction as it's received and before sending it on, every node is building a pool of valid transactions known as a transaction pool, memory pool, or mempool. So now let's talk about the mining nodes. Some of the nodes in the Bitcoin network are specialized nodes called miners. Some miners mine without a, mi a full node, as we'll see in mining pools. Some miners mine using specialized mining hardware. Some just use regular computers. So a mining node is listening for new blocks sent on the B Bitcoin network, as do all nodes. However, the arrival of a new block has special significance for a mining node. The competition among miners effectively ends with the sent and propagation of a new block that acts as an announcement of a winner in the previous competition. To miners, receiving a valid new block means someone else won the competition and they lost. However, the end of one round of a competition is also the beginning of the next round. The new block is not just a checkered flag marking the end of the race. It's also the starting pistol in the race for the next block. So let's talk about aggregating transactions in the blocks. Um, after validating transactions, the Bitcoin node will add the transactions into the memory pool, sometimes referred to as a transaction pool or the mempool, where transactions wait until they can be included or mined into a block. So nodes collect, validate, and relay new transactions. Unlike other nodes, however, nodes will then aggregate the, uh, uh, mining nodes will then aggregate these transactions into a candidate block. So a mining, this block has become valid only if the miner succeeds in finding a solution to the proof of work algorithm. Um, now, in addition to all of the transactions that we pull out of the transaction pool, the miners can also create one special transaction to put in the beginning of this block, and that's the Coinbase transaction. So the first transaction in a block is a special transaction called the Coinbase transaction, which is used to pay the miner. So it will contain the address uh, for which the miner is going to receive his, his or her Bitcoin, uh, which is typically going to be currently, it'll be six and a quarter Bitcoin, um, as well as the transaction fees. And so that miner will include that payment uh, to the miner's address of that many Bitcoin. Unlike regular 
transactions, the Coinbase transaction does not consume any unspent transaction outputs as inputs because um, we're not you know, paying the miner from anywhere uh, from a previous transaction. Instead, it only has one input uh, called the Coinbase, which creates Bitcoin from nothing. The Coinbase transaction has one output payable to the miner's own Bitcoin address. Uh, and so the output of the Coinbase transaction will send that value to the Bitcoin, the miner's Bitcoin address. Uh, to construct the Coinbase transaction, first you would calculate the total number of transaction fees by adding all the inputs and outputs of the transactions that were added in the block. Then you would add that to the block reward, and that would give you the total amount of Bitcoin that is going to the miner. And with that, those calculations, you then construct a Coinbase transaction to pay the miner the appropriate amount of Bitcoins. Here we see the structure of a normal transaction input. Um, you've got a transaction hash, an output index, an unlocking script size, an unlocking script, and a sequence number. And here we see the structure of a Coinbase transaction input. We've got a transaction hash, an output index, a Coinbase data size, a Coinbase data, and a sequence number. So the sequence number, the transaction hash, and the output index are essentially the same. However, there are two, uh, we've got a data size, in a Coinbase data size, instead of an unlocking script size. And instead of having a locking script, which has conditions for the UTXO locking script, we now have this Coinbase data field. So let me talk about, and but, in addition to having two differences in the fields, we also have several differences in the description. So for example, um, in the Coinbase transaction input, it's just a whole bunch of zeros. Whereas in a normal transaction, you have a transaction hash that points to the transaction containing the UTXO to be spent. In the output index, we just have a bunch of ones. Whereas um, in a normal output index, you would be specifying which index number of the UTXO was you're spending. Um, again, there's no unlocking script size or unlocking script. Instead, so we have the Coinbase data size and Coinbase data. This is just some arbitrary data that's typically used in the mining algorithm. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then we got a sequence number, which is set to um, zero X times a bunch of Fs, which is usually what a normal transaction will be set to as well. So let's talk about the Coinbase data field. Coinbase transactions do not have an unlocking script or a script SIG. Instead, that data field is replaced by Coinbase data, which must be between two and 100 bytes. Except for the first couple bytes, the rest of the Coinbase data can be used in miners in any way they want. It's arbitrary data. Uh, in the Genesis block, for example, Satoshi Nakamoto added the text, the time 03 January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks in the Coinbase data field, using it as a proof that the blockchain didn't start processing before um, this headline was uh, released on this newspaper, which was on January 3rd or the night before, and also to convey a message that um, hey, one of the reasons we're launching Bitcoin is because we think banks uh, are vulnerable. Currently, miners use the Coinbase data to include extra nonce values in strings identifying the mining pool. So they use these extra nonce values in the proof of work algorithm, and they use the strings identifying the mining pool to identif help identify who's actually uh, winning these rewards. So BIP 34, uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 34, uh, created a way in which you can uh, push information into the block stuff. Uh, but this is how you would describe uh, the data that you would put in the beginning of a Coinbase field. Uh, you would have this value here, for example, um, to identify the mining node. You'd have the block height and so on. Um, and then you'd have your knots uh, in the middle here for working with the proof of work solution. So here's the structure of a block header. To construct the block header, the mining node needs to fill in six fields um, shown here. The version, which is version number to track the uh, software protocol upgrades, 
previous block hash, which is a reference to the hash uh, of the previous block in the chain, a Merkle root, which is a hash of all the transactions in the current block, a timestamp, which comes from the miners machine, proof of work algorithm target for this block, that's your current difficulty, and a nonce, which is used, uh, counter used for the proof of work algorithm. And again, this nonce is only four bytes, so we'll also probably use some of the data in the Coinbase data field to make our nonce bigger uh, for mining purposes. So once a block is constructed by a mining node, the node starts to find a solution to the proof of work algorithm that makes the block valid. So we've talked a lot about cryptographic hash functions. Um, so now we're gonna talk about how to use SHA-256 uh, as it's used in Bitcoin's mining process. So in the simplest terms, mining is a process of hashing the block header repeatedly, uh, changing one parameter, the nonce, until the resulting hash matches a specific target. The hash function's result can't be determined in advance uh, because it's unpredictable, nor can a pattern be created that's gonna produce a specific hash value. Instead, um, it means the only way to produce a hash result matching a specific target is to try again and again, um, trying many, many times, essentially brute forcing until eventually we get an answer that solves the problem. Um, and so we essentially just in increment the input until we get um, the desired hash result. So let's talk about our proof of work algorithm in a little more detail. So our hashing algorithm is going to take an arbitrary length data input and produce a fixed length deterministic result, which is a digital fingerprint of the input. For any specific input, the resulting hash will always be the same, can be easily calculated and verified by anyone implementing the same hash algorithm. The key characteristic of a cryptographic hash algorithm is that it's computationally infeasible to find two different inputs that produce the same fingerprint, known as a collision. Um, collisions happen, but we can't predictably find them. So as a corollary, it's also virtually impossible to select an input in such a way as to produce a desired fingerprint other than trying random inputs. So with SHA-256, the output's always 256 bits long, regardless of the size of the input. So for example, let's suppose we want to calculate the hash of I am Satoshi Nakamoto. Well, here's our result. It's 5D, 7C, 7BA, 21, and so on, um, um, out to 256 bits. So that 256-bit number is the hash or the digest of the phrase, I am Satoshi Nakamoto, and depends on the entire phrase. If we modify that phrase in any way, we'll get a completely different hash output. Um, and it's unpredictable as to what our new hash value will be. So for example, if we add a number to the end, it's gonna generate a different hash. So here we can see adding I am Satoshi Nakamoto zero. And this time I got A80, A814, 017, et cetera. Again, remember these are hexadecimal numbers. So it's zero through nine and A through F. Um, I am Satoshi Nakamoto one, we get F7, B, C, et cetera. I am Satoshi Nakamoto two, we get EA75 and so on. Um, so this number we're adding to I am Satoshi Nakamoto, the zero, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, is typically referred to as a nonce. Um, and we can keep integrating this to thousands or millions until we find the output we're looking for. So let's suppose, for example, we want an output that begins with the number zero. Um, and after zero, we really don't care what kind of output we get. So in that case, it only take us seven or actually eight attempts to do that because I am Satoshi Nakamoto seven begins with the number zero. Um, and so that would satisfy our output concerns. And it took us approximately eight tries because we zero through seven. So if we only want one leading zero, uh, we could get that in eight tries. But let's say I want three leading zeros. Well, none of these had three leading zeros, so we'd have to keep on going. And it might take us hundreds or thousands before we actually get three leading zeros. Um, and that's essentially what Bitcoin's proof of work is asking for. It's asking for a certain number of leading zeros to be achieved, which can require millions or billions or billions of billions of hashes before you find the target.
So in numerical terms, this means finding a hash value that's less than uh, this particular number is our target. And the goal is to find a hash that's numerically equal or less than the target. And the smaller you make the target, the longer it's going to take to find a hash. You know, another example is let's suppose that um, we, we had a dice game and you're going to throw two six sided dice. Um, and we said, uh, we just want one of the two dice to come up with sixes. Well, in that case, um, one of the two dices should come up a six um, approximately every third time. On the other hand, let's say we said we want both dice to come up a six. That should come up about once every 36 times. So the more number of sixes you need, the harder it's going to be. And so in this case, with hashing, it's, it's uh, in proof of work, it's the more number of zeros. And the reason why we call this proof of work is because there's an average amount of work necessary to achieve one of these random results. Uh, we consider the fact that you found a solution proof that you did a fair amount of work to find that solution. Now it is random, but we're saying that the average is that you did a that you did an average amount of work to achieve it. And the lower the target is, the more work that's necessary. So let's take a more detailed look at how exactly um, this works. So let's suppose, for example, that um, here is our notation for our proof of work difficulty. This uh, our target field has this particular hexadecimal number in it. 0x, 19, 03, A3, 0C. Now remember, these are hexadecimal numbers. So one is a one, nine is a nine, nine zero is 10, that's three, that's A, three, that's 10, you know, and A through C and F, all the way up to 16. Okay, so the first two hexadecimal digits are the exponent. So 19 is the exponent, and 0, 03A, 30C is our coefficient. The next six okay so the way they calculate it is the target equals the coefficient times two to raise to a power and that power is exponent minus three times eight all right so what does this mean so it means our target equals again this coefficient zero three a thirty c in hexadecimal times two 0x80. So it's 80 in hexadecimal terms. All right. Which means this becomes essentially 243, 348 times 2 to the 176. That's a pretty large number. You know, 2 to the 176, that's, uh, that's getting way up there in terms of size. That's something like, you know, in decimal terms, that's a number with like 55 zeros after it. So Bitcoin's blocks are generated every 10 minutes. Um, actually, but let's get back to that large number a minute ago. So let's say we've got this number here. Um, and actually, the more I think about it, I think it's more than 60 leading bits, so it'd have to be set to zero. So you would need to do something like, let's suppose you had a miner who could do 1 trillion hashes per second, uh, which is also referred to as 1 terahash per second. That miner would only find a solution on average about every 9,000 blocks or so, or every two months. Um, so that gives you an idea of how long it can take to find a solution. Um, so really, one terahash per second is not going to be enough 
to you know, really compete. You're, you're going to want numbers even more uh, greater than that. You're going to want to be able to mine more than a terahash per second, uh, more than a trillion hashes per second. So I mentioned earlier that as more miners join the competition and as Bitcoin's value goes up, um, Bitcoin can reduce or increase the difficulty to accommodate uh, changes in the number of miners. As miners join, the difficulty will go up. As miners leave, the difficulty will go down. And the way it is done is every two weeks, uh, it's going to have to uh, recalculate it. So that leads to the question then is why, why is it adjustable? Who adjusts it and how? So we want it to be uh, dependably 10 minutes on average so that our currency issuance is predictable over time. Our speed of transaction settlement is predictable over time. And we want it to be predictable for decades, not just this week or next week. Um, and we know the computer power is gonna increase over time. And we know participants are gonna change uh, over time as well. So the way um, we make these adjustments in our decentralized network, is that um, retargeting the difficulty is gonna occur automatically and on every node independently. Every 2016 blocks, all the nodes are going to have to uh, retarget the proof of work. And there's an equation they use. The equation for retargeting measures the time it took to find the last 2016 blocks and compares that to the expected time of 20,160 minutes which will be 10 minutes times the number of blocks, 2016 blocks. Now then, now that we have this uh, time it took to find those uh, blocks in actuality and the ex ideal expected time, the ratio between the actual time and the desired time is calculated. And then we make a proportionate adjustment up or down to the target. In simple terms, if the network is finding blocks faster than every 10 minutes, the difficulty will increase, the target will decrease. If block discovery is slower than expected, the difficulty will decrease and the target will increase. So our uh, equation can be summarized as new target equals old target times the ratio between the actual time of the last 2016 blocks and 20,160 minutes. So to avoid um, extreme volatility and the difficulty, the retargeting adjustment um, will try and make sure it doesn't uh, uh, increase by more than a factor of four. Um, therefore, if there's been a massive change, uh, like let's say there was a, a ratio of eight, then it might actually take you four weeks before you catch up as opposed to two weeks. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is the difficulty of mining is closely related to the cost of electricity and the exchange rate of Bitcoin used to pay for electricity. You know, high performance mining systems are extremely efficient um, with the current generation of ASICs. Uh, converting electricity into hashing computation at the highest rate possible. The primary influence in the mining market is the price of electricity in Bitcoin because that determines the profitability of mining and therefore incentives to enter and exit the mining market. However, this year, because of COVID-19, uh, there's been a number of delays in the supply chain. And so mining has become extremely profitable because miners haven't been able to bring as many mine ra mining rigs online as they would like to. Uh, it's also been impacted by miners moving out of China. Um, and so this is actually probably the most profitable year for miners ever. So let's talk about successfully mining the block. As we saw earlier, um, you know, candidate blocks are created and prepared for mining. 
Um, specialized machines are connected to the mining node, typically over a local area network. Uh, mining nodes will transmit the block headers to the mining hardware, which will then start testing trillions of nonces per second. Because the nonce is only 32 bits, after exhausting all the nonce possibilities, the mining hardware will then adjust the block header using the extra nonce space in the Coinbase, uh, testing new combinations. Um, once you discover a solution, which is a hash lesser than a target, the mining node will immediately transmit the block to all its peers. Um, typically, we're talking about sending it to eight peers that are nearby. Those peers will receive the block, they'll validate it, and then they'll send it to the eight of their peers. And so the block will ripple out across the network. Uh, within a minute, all of the nodes in the network will receive the new block and it will be added onto their blockchains. And as the new mining nodes receive and validate the block, they'll abandon their current effort to solve the current problem and immediately start competing for the next block in the chain using the newly received block as a parent. By building on top of the newly discovered block, the other miners are essentially voting with their mining power and endorsing the block and the chain it extends. So let's talk about validating a new block. The third step in Bitcoin's consensus mechanism is independent validation of each new block by every node on the network. As the newly solved block moves across the network, each node performs a series of tests to validate it before propagating it to its peers. This ensures that only valid blocks are propagated on the network. The independent validation also ensures that miners who act honestly get their blocks included in the blockchain, thus earning the, the block reward. Those miners who act dishonestly will have their blocks rejected and not only lose the reward, but also waste the effort expended to find a proof of work solution, thus incurring the cost of electricity without being compensated. When a node receives a new block, it will validate the block by checking against a long list of criteria that must all be met. Otherwise, the block is rejected. So here's some of the block validation criteria. And you can see these block validation criteria uh, if you look in the Bitcoin core client and the functions check block and check block header. So the various things that are checked include that the block data structure is syntactically, syntactically valid, the block header hash is equal to or less than the target. You know, we're confirming that they did solve the proof of work. Uh, the block timestamp is less than two hours in the future allowing for some difference in time between your machine and the miner's machine. Uh, the block size is within acceptable limits. Uh, the first transaction and only the first is a coin-based transaction. And all transactions within the block are valid using the transaction checklist that we talked about in previous slides. So the independent validation of each new block by every node in the network uh, ensures that the miners cannot cheat. Uh, earlier, we talked about the fact that miners get to write a transaction that awards them the new block Bitcoin contained within block and claim the transaction fees. So this is how we ensure that miners don't write themselves a transaction for an inappropriate amount of Bitcoin. Because every node validates blocks according to the same rules, the miners can't cheat. An invalid Coinbase transaction would make the entire block invalid which would result in the block being rejected and therefore the transaction would never become part of the blockchain. So miners have to construct a perfect block based on the shared rules that all nodes follow. And then they have to mine it with a correct solution to the proof of work. And to do so, the miners expend a lot of electricity in mining. And if they cheat, all that electricity and effort is wasted. This is why independent validation is a key component of Bitcoin's decentralized, decentralized consensus algorithm. So let's talk about assembling and selecting chains of blocks. The final step in Bitcoin's decentralized consensus mechanism is the assembly of blocks into chains and the selection of the blockchain with the most proof of work. Once a node has validated a new block, it will then attempt to assemble a chain by connecting the block to the existing blockchain. Nodes maintain three sets of blocks, those connected to the main blockchain, those that form branches off the main blockchain like secondary chains, and finally blocks that don't have a known block parent in the known chains. These are considered as orphan blocks. Invalid blocks are rejected as soon as any one of the validation criteria fails, and they're not gonna be included in any of these three sets of blocks. 
The main chain at any time is whatever valid chain of blocks has the most cumulative proof of work associated with it. Under most circumstances, this is also the chain with the most blocks in it, unless there are two equal length chains and one has more proof of work. The main chain will also have branches with blocks that are siblings to the blocks on the main chain. These blocks are valid, but are not part of the main chain. They are kept for future reference in case one of those chains is extended to exceed the main chain in proof of work. In a little bit, we're going to talk about how secondary chains occur as a result of almost simultaneous mining of blocks of the same height. When a new block is received, a node will try to slot it into the existing blockchain. The node will look at the parent's previous block hash field, uh, which is a reference to the block's parent. Then the node will attempt to find that parent in the existing blockchain. Most of the time, the parent will be the tip of the main chain, meaning this new block extends the, name, the, uh, the main chain. Sometimes a new block extends a chain that is not the main chain. In that case, the node will attach the new block to the secondary chain it extends and then compare the work of the secondary chain to the main chain. If the secondary chain is more cumulative work than the main chain, the node will reconverge on the secondary chain, meaning it will select the secondary chain as its new main chain, making the old main chain a secondary chain. If the node is a minor, it will now construct a block extending this new longer chain. If a valid block is received and no parent is found in the existing chain, that block is considered an orphan block. Orphan blocks are saved in the orphan block pool where they will stay until their parent block is received. Once the parent is received and linked into the existing chain, the orphan can be pulled out of the orphan pool and linked to the parent, making it a part of the chain. Orphan blocks usually occur when two blocks that were mined within a short time of each other are received in reverse order, child before parent. By selecting the greatest cumulative uh, work valid chain, all nodes eventually achieve network-wide consensus. Temporary discrepancies between chains are resolved eventually as more work is added, extending one of the possible chains. Mining nodes will vote with their mining power by choosing which chain to extend by mining the next block. When they mine a new block and extend the chain, the new block itself represents their vote. So now we're going to talk about how discrepancies between competing chains are resolved by the independent selection of the greatest cumulative work chain, which is uh, the topic of blockchain forks. Because the blockchain is a decentralized data st structure, different copies of it are not always consistent. Remember, there's over 10,000 blockchain nodes out there, and, but they're only communicating with eight of their neighbors and they're sending messages across. Uh, the network. And so there can be some uh, inconsistencies in terms of when blocks arrive at different nodes, um, causing the nodes to have a different perspective of the blockchain. To resolve this, each node always selects and attempts to extend the chain of blocks that represents the most proof of work, also known as the longest chain or the greatest cumulative work chain. By summing the work recorded in each block in a chain, a node can calculate the total amount of work that's been expended to create that chain. As long as all nodes select the greatest cumulative work chain, the global Bitcoin network eventually converges to a consistent state. So forks occur as temporary inconsistencies between versions of the blockchain, which are resolved by eventual reconvergence as more blocks are added to one of the forks. Um, so the first part of the blockchain forks that I'm going to look at are forks that occur in, naturally in the blockchain as a result of transmission delays in the global network. Later on, I'm going to talk about deliberately created forks, which are used to modify consensus rules. So what we're going to do now is through the next few diagrams, we're going to follow the progress of a fork event across the network. Uh, this diagram is a simplified representation of the Bitcoin network. We're not going to show all 10,000 nodes. Instead, we only have about 20 nodes here. Uh, but each node has its own perspective of the global blockchain. As each node receives blocks from its neighbors, it's going to update its own copy of the blockchain, selecting the greatest cumulative work chain. 
Uh, for illustration purposes, each node is gonna contain a shape that represents the block that it believes currently is the tip of the main chain. So if you see a star shape in the node, that means the star block is the top of the main chain as far as that node is concerned. So here in our first diagram, um, we've got our star at the top of the blockchain, and then it's got a pointer to previous blocks, which we're just gonna put in black here. Right now, all the nodes believe star is the top of the blockchain. Now we've had a fork event. So this fork occurred because two different valid blocks, at the same block height, are competing to form the longest blockchain. This occurs under normal conditions whenever two miners solve the proof of work algorithm within a short period of time from each other. As both miners discover a solution for their respective candidate blocks, they immediately broadcast their own winning block to their neighbors, who then begin sending the block across the network. Each node that receives a valid block will incorporate it into its blockchain, extending the blockchain by one block. If the node later sees another valid block extending the same parent at the same block height, it will connect the second block on a secondary chain, forking its main chain. As a result, some nodes will see one winning block first, while other nodes will see the other winning block first, and the two competing versions of the blockchain will emerge. So here we see two miners, uh, which we'll call node X and node Y, who have mined different blocks almost simultaneously. Both of these blocks are children of the star block, uh, and extend the chain by building on top of the star block. Uh, to help us track it, uh, we, we have the uh, one is a triangle block extending from node, node X. And then we also have the upside down triangle extending from node Y, which is also orange to give you a different color here. Um, and so we can see right now at this stage in the blockchain network, we actually have three different states. Uh, the nodes that are near node X believe that the triangle is the top of the blockchain. The nodes that are near node Y believe that the upside down triangle is the uh, top of the blockchain. And the nodes in the middle haven't been contacted by either miner, and they are still believe that star is the top of the blockchain. So as, um, you know, as a minute passes, all the nodes in the blockchain are contacted by both miners. And so the current state is um, shown for those uh, nodes is shown in this diagram. So let's assume, for example, that when uh, miner node X found the proof of work solution for the block triangle uh, and node Y has upside down triangle, um, you know, some nodes are receiving triangle first, some nodes are receiving upside down triangle first. Um, and so we can see here, for example, it looks like there's about eight or so nodes that have triangle and there's eight that have upside down triangle. Now, both of them have been notified, but the key is that um, the ones on the left received the, the, the regular triangle first. And so they were notified later about the orange triangle. And so they believe the, the regular triangle is valid. The upside down orange triangle is invalid. On the right side, they received upside down triangle first, so they believe it's valid, and they believe that the regular triangle is um, a secondary chain because it came later. And so currently half the blockchain believes that the regular triangle is the longest chain, the other half of the uh, blockchain believes upside down triangle is the longest chain. But, and each of them maintains the other chain as a secondary chain in case that chain is later uh, determined to be the longest blockchain because of a long, uh, the longest amount of proof of work. Now, eventually, some node in the blockchain is going to mine a new block based on their version of the chain. And then when they send that across the network, then their block, assuming they don't have an, another or immediate competitor, their block will become the longest blockchain. So here, that's what we see. We see that um, the rhombus has been mined by a block that was previously extending the white triangle. And so now every uh, node that has been notified um, that, hey, I discovered the rhombus block uh, is now going to accept that as being the longest blockchain. Um, because it's got additional proof of work from yet another block being added to it. And so the 
the upside down triangle is now considered a stale block. And so all miners who receive the rhombus will now immediately work on candidate blocks that reference rhombus as apparent to extend the star triangle rhombus chain. And so um, the orange block is now obsolete. And so now everybody in the blockchain is working on rhombus. So this is a chain reconvergence because those nodes who were working on the orange triangle are now forced to revise their view of the blockchain to incorporate the new evidence of a longer chain. Um, and since orange chain orange block is not part of the blockchain anymore, uh, the miner who originally solved that solution, um, node Y, won't be able to spend the mining reward for this block. And that's why mining rewards are limited so that you can't spend them until 100 blocks have gone by because there can be some of these chain reorganizations or reconvergences. So we don't want miners who uh, will later have their block be reconverged uh, to spend cryptocurrency. Um, so that's why we make it wait 100 blocks before the miners can spend. Bitcoin's block interval of 10 minutes is the design compromise between fast confirmation times for settlement of transactions and the probability of a fork. A faster block time would make transactions faster, but could also lead to more blockchain forks, whereas a slower block time decreases the number of forks, but makes settlements slower. Let's talk about mining in the hashing race. Bitcoin mining is an extremely competitive industry. Hashing power has increased exponentially every year, uh, some years, the growth has reflected a complete change in technology, such as in 2010, 2011, when my, many miners switched from using CPU mining to GP graphic processing units and field programmable gate array mining. In 2013, the introduction of ASIC mining led to another giant leap in mining power by placing the SHA-256 function directly on silicon chips specialized for the purposes of mining. Uh, the first uh, ASIC chips could deliver more mining power in a single box than the entire Bitcoin network in 2010. Here's a look at the growth of the Bitcoin network in terahashes per second. In 2009, uh, the Bitcoin network had you know, a fraction of terahashes per second. 2010. It, the Bitcoin network grew 14,000 times. Um, 2011, the Bitcoin network grew 63 times. Um, no longer being decimals of terahashes, but actually being into a, a number of terahashes per second. 2013, when ASICs came along, Bitcoin's growth grew dramatically again, 723 times growth that year. Uh, more recent years, it's been increasing, but not as much. Here's a look at the total hash power in terahashes per second. You know, estimate amount of hashing power used in the last 24 hours. And here's a look at the ASIC uh, network difficulty, a relative measure of how difficult it is to mine a new block. You know, when it was CPU is relatively easy back in 2009 when only Satoshi was mining. Uh, but then as other people started mining, it's going up dramatically. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Bitcoin nonce uh, ran out of space. And so that's why people started using the uh, Coinbase data uh, to give them additional uh, information they can increment to allow a greater number of possibilities. Um, Bitcoin miners can explore approximately two to the 96 possibilities per second using the eight bytes of the extra nonce and the four bytes of the standard nonce. And there's also additional space in the Coinbase script for future expansion of the extra nonce space. So let's talk about mining pools. Um, in this highly competitive environment, individual miners working alone 
also known as solo miners, um, face heavy odds. The likelihood of finding a block to offset their electricity and hardware costs is so low that it would represent a gamble like playing the lottery. Even the fastest consumer ASIC mining system can't keep up with commercial systems that stack tens of thousands of these chips in giant warehouses near hydroelectric power stations. Miners now collaborate to form mining pools, pooling their hashing power and sharing the reward among thousands of participants. By participating in a pool, miners get a smaller share of the overall reward, but typically get rewarded every day, reducing uncertainty. Let's look at a specific example. Assume a miner has purchased mining hardware with a combined hash rate of 14,000 gigahashes per second, uh, or 14 terahashes per second. In 2017, that equipment would cost approximately $2,500. The hardware would consume 1375 watts of electricity uh, or 33 kilowatt hours a day at a cost of a, a dollar to two dollar per day at very low electricity rates. At current Bitcoin difficulty, the miner would be able to solo mine a block approximately once every four years. Um, so, if the miner does find a single block in that time frame, the payment of 6.2 big five bitcoins at approximately thousand dollars a bit, uh, or approximately uh, a certain amount of bitcoin, can result in a payout. But the question is, when did he or she find that uh, block? If they found it when the value of bitcoin was extremely high, then they made a lot of money. If they found it when the value of Bitcoin was low, then they didn't make as much money. And it's very unpredictable as to whether or not you would actually find it in that four-year period. You might find two blocks in four years. You might find one in eight years. Um, and so because of all these financial difficulties and unpredictability, miners have decided to collaborate in mining pools. So they have predictable amounts of uh, rewards that they can receive. Mining pools coordinate many hundreds or thousands of miners over specialized pool mining protocols. The individual miners configure their mining equipment to connect to a pool server, and they'll specify a Bitcoin address which will receive their share of the rewards. Their mining hardware remains connected to the pool server while mining, synchronizing their efforts with other miners. Thus, the pool miners share the effort to mine a block and then share the rewards. Successful blocks pay the reward to a pool Bitcoin address rather than the miner's address. Pool server will periodically make payments to the miner's Bitcoin addresses once their share of the rewards has reached a certain threshold. Typically, the pool server charges a percentage fee of the rewards providing the pool mining service. Miners participating in a pool split the work of searching for a solution to a candidate block, earning shares for the mining contribution. The mining pool will set a higher target for earning a share, typically more than a thousand times easier than the Bitcoin network's target. When someone in the pool successfully mines a block, the reward is earned by the pool and then shared with all miners in proportion to the number of shares that contribute to the effort. Pools are open to any miner, big or small, professional or amateur. A pool will therefore have some participants with a single small mining machine and others with a garage full of high-end hardware and others with a warehouse. Some will be mining with a few tens of kilowatts of electricity. Others will be running a data center with megabots of power. Um, the pool uses uh, Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm to measure each pool miner's contribution so that even the smallest Bitcoin pool miners win a share frequently enough to make it worthwhile to contribute to the pool. Uh, the pool measures the amount of work done by each miner. Each time a pool miner finds a block header that is equal to or less than the pool target, that uh, miner proves that they did the hashing work to find a result. More importantly, the work to find shares contributes in a statistical measurable way to the overall effort to find a hash equal to or lower than the Bitcoin's network target. Thousands of miners trying to find low value hashes will eventually find one low enough to satisfy the Bitcoin network target. Most mining pools are managed, meaning that there's a company or individual running the pool server. The owner of the pool server is called the pool operator uh, and, he, and that pool operator charges pool miners a percentage fee of the earnings. The pool server runs specialized software and a pool mining protocol that coordinates the activities of the pool miners. Pool server is also connected to one or more full Bitcoin nodes and has direct access to a full copy of the blockchain database. This allows the pool server to validate blocks and transactions on behalf of the pool miners relieving them of the burden of running a full node. For pool miners, this is an important consideration because a full node requires a dedicated computer with at least 400 gigs persistent storage and at least uh, four gigs RAM. 
Furthermore, the Bitcoin software running the full node needs to be monitored, maintained, and upgraded frequently. Any downtime caused by a lack of maintenance or lack of resources will hurt the miner's profitability. For many miners, the ability to mine without running a full node is another benefit of joining a managed pool. Pool miners connect to uh, a pool server using pool uh, mining protocols such as Stratum or Get Block Template or Get Work. The pool server constructs a candidate block by aggregating transactions, adds a Coinbase transaction to it, calculates the Merkle root, and links to the previous block hash. The header of the candidate block is then sent to the pool miners as a template. Each pool miner then mines using the block template at a tar higher target than the Bitcoin network tar target, and then sends any successful results back to the pool server to earn shares. So let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer mining pool or P2Pool. Managed pools create the possibility of cheating by the pool operator who might direct the pool effort to double spend transactions or invalidate blocks. Furthermore, centralized pool servers represent a single point of failure. If the pool server is down or slowed by a denial of service attack, pool miners can't mine. To resolve these issues of centralization, a new pool mining method was proposed and implemented, peer-to-pool, -peer, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer mining pool without a central operator. Uh, peer to peer peer-to-pool works by decentralizing the functions of the pool server, implementing a parallel blockchain-like system called a share chain. A uh, share chain in a blockchain is running at lower difficulty than the Bitcoin blockchain. The share chain allows pool miners to collaborate in a decentralized pool by mining shares in the share chain at a rate of one share block every 30 seconds. Each of the blocks in the share chain records a disproportionate share reward for the pool miners who contribute work, carrying the shares forward from the previous share block. When one of the share blocks also achieves the Bitcoin network target, it is transmitted and included on the Bitcoin blockchain rewarding all the pool miners contribute to all the shares and proceed to the winning share block. Essentially, instead of a pool server keeping track of pool miner shares and rewards, the share chain allows all pool miners to keep track of all shares using a decentralized consensus mechanism like Bitcoin's blockchain consensus mechanism. Peer-to-pool mining is more complicated than pool mining because it requires that the pool miners run a dedicated computer with enough disk space, memory, and bandwidth to support a full Bitcoin node and the peer-to-pool node software. Peer-to-pool miners connect their mining hardware to their local peer-to-pool -peer node, which simulates the function of the pool server by sending block templates to the mining hardware. On peer-to-pool, individual pool miners construct their own candidate blocks, aggregating transactions much like solo miners, but then mine collaboratively on the share chain. Peer-to-pool is a hybrid approach that has the advantage of more granular payouts in solo mining without giving too much control to a pool operator like managed pools. Even though peer-to-pool reduces concentration of power by mining pool operators, it's conceivably vulnerable to attacks against the share chain. So let's talk about a 51% attack. Bitcoin's consensus mechanism is at least theoretically vulnerable to attack by miners or mining pools that attempt to use their hashing power for dishonest or destructive ends. Um, as we saw, the consensus mechanism depends on having a majority of the miners acting honestly out of self-interest. However, if a miner or a group of miners can achieve a significant share of the mining power, they can attack the consensus mechanism so as to disrupt, disrupt the security and availability of the Bitcoin network. It's important to note that consensus attacks can only affect future consensus or at best the most recent past. Uh, Bitcoin's ledger becomes more and more immutable as time passes. While in theory a fork can be achieved in any depth, in practice the computing power needed to force a very deep fork is immense, making old blocks practically immutable. Consensus attacks also do not affect the security of the private keys and the signing algorithm. A consensus attack cannot steal Bitcoin, spend Bitcoin without signatures, redirect Bitcoin, or otherwise change past transactions or ownership records. Consensus attacks can only affect the most recent blocks and cause denial of service disruptions on the creation of future blocks. One attack scenario against the consensus mechanism is called the 51% attack. With, in this scenario, a group of miners controlling a majority of the total network's hashing power can collude to attack blockchain. 
and particularly Bitcoin. With the ability to mine the majority of the blocks, the attacking miners can cause deliberate forks in the blockchain and double spend transactions or execute denial of service attacks against specific transactions or addresses. A fork double spend attack is where the attacker causes previously confirmed blocks to be invalidated by forking below them and reconverging on an alternate chain. With sufficient power, an attacker can validate six or more blocks in a row, causing transactions that were considered immutable, i.e. having six confirmations to be invalidated. Note that a double spend can only be done on the attacker's own transactions for which the attacker can produce a valid signature. Double spending one's own transactions is profitable if in validating a transaction, uh, the attacker can get an irreversible exchange payment or product without paying for it. Let's example, examine a practical example of a 51% attack. So we have the example of a transaction where Alice buys a cup of coffee from Bob, the cafe owner. Now, normally Bob, the cafe owner, is willing to accept payment for cups of coffee without waiting for confirmations because the risk of a double spend on a cup of a cup of coffee is low in comparison to the convenience of rapid customer service. This is similar to the practice of, of stores that accept credit card payments without a signature for small amounts because the risk of a credit card chargeback charge back is low while the cost of delaying the transaction to obtain the signature is larger. In contrast, selling a more expensive item for Bitcoin runs the risk of a double spend attack where the buyer broadcasts a competing transaction, spends the same inputs, the UTXOs, and cancels a payment to the merchant. A double spend attack can happen in two ways either before the transaction is confirmed or if the attacker takes advantage of a blockchain fork to undo several blocks. A 51% attack allows attackers to double spend their own transactions in the new chain, thus undoing the corresponding transaction in the old chain. So in our example, malicious attacker Mallory goes to Carol's gallery and purchases a beautiful painting uh, Carol sells this painting for $250,000 in Bitcoin to Mallory. Uh, instead of waiting for six or more confirmations on the transaction, Carol wraps and hands the painting to Mallory after only one confirmation. Mallory works with an accomplice, Paul, who operates a large mining pool, and the accomplice launches a 51% attack as soon as Mallory's transaction is included in a block. Paul directs the mining pool to remine the same block height as a block containing Mallory's transaction, replacing Mallory's payment to Carol for transaction that double spends the same input as Mallory's payment. This double spend transaction consumes the same UTXO and pays it back to Mallory's wallet instead of paying it to Carol, essentially allowing Mallory to keep the Bitcoin. Paul then directs the mining pool to mine an additional block so as to make the chain containing the double spend transaction longer than the original chain, causing a fork. Uh, when the blockchain fork resolves in favor of the new longer chain, the double spent transaction replaces the original payment to Carol. Carol's now missing the painting and also doesn't have her Bitcoin payment. Throughout all this activity, Paul's mining pool participants might remain unaware of the double spent attempt because they mine with automated miners and don't monitor every transaction or block. So to protect against um, this kind of attack, a merchant selling large value items should wait for at least six confirmations before giving the product to the buyer. Alternatively, the merchant could use an escrow multi-signature attack account uh, while waiting for several confirmations after the escrow account is funded. The more confirmations elapse, the harder it will become to invalidate a transaction with a 51% attack. For high value items, payment by Bitcoin will still be convenient and efficient, even if the buyer has to wait 24 hours for delivery, which would be the equivalent of 144 confirmations. In addition to a double spend attack, another scenario for a consensus attack is to deny service, a denial of service attack uh, to specific Bitcoin addresses. An attacker with the majority of the mining pool can simply ignore specific transactions. If they're included in a block mined by another miner, the attacker can deliberately fork and remind that block, again, excluding those transactions. This time, of attack can result in sustained denial of service against a specific address or set of addresses for as long as the attacker controls the majority of the mining pool. Despite its name, the 51% attack scenario doesn't actually require 
51% of the hashing power. In fact, such an attack can be attempted with a smaller percentage. The 51% threshold is simply the level at which such an attack is almost guaranteed to succeed. A consensus attack is essentially a tug of war for the next block, and the stronger group is more likely to win. With less hashing power, the probability of success is reduced because other miners control the generation of some blocks with their honest mining power. One way to look at it is that the more hashing power an attacker has, the longer the fork the attacker can deliberately create, the more blocks in the recent past the attacker can invalidate, or the more blocks in the future the attacker can control. Security research groups have used statistical modeling to claim that various types of consensus attacks are possible with as little as 30% of the hashing power. The massive increase of total hash hashing power has arguably made Bitcoin impervious to attacks uh, by a single miner. There's no possible way for a solo miner to control more than a small percentage of the total mining power. However, the centralization of control caused by mining pools has introduced the risk for of for-profit attacks by a mining pool operator. The pool operator in a managed pool controls the construction of candidate blocks and also controls which transactions are included. This gives the pool operator the power to exclude transactions or introduce double spend transactions. If such abuse of power is done in a subtle way, a pool operator could conceivably profit from a consensus attack without being noticed. Not all attackers will be motivated by profit, however. One potential attack scenario is where an attacker attempts to disrupt the Bitcoin network without the possibility of profit. A malicious attack aimed at crippling Bitcoin would require enormous investment in covert planning, but conceivably could be launched by a well-funded state-sponsored attacker. Alternatively, a well-funded attacker could attack Bitcoin's consensus by simultaneously amassing Bitcoin hardware, compromising pool operators, and attacking other pools with denial of service. All of these scenarios are theoretically possible, but become increasingly impractical as the Bitcoin network's hashing power grows. Undoubtedly, a serious consensus attack would erode confidence in Bitcoin, causing a significant price decline. However, the Bitcoin network and software are constantly evolving, so consensus attacks will be met with countermeasures by the Bitcoin community, making Bitcoin more survivable and robust. Let's talk about changing the consensus rules. The rules of consensus determine the validity of transactions and blocks. These rules are the basis for collaboration between all Bitcoin nodes and are responsible for the convergence of all local perspectives into a single consistent blockchain across the entire network. While the consensus rules are invariable in the short term and must be consistent across all nodes, they are not invariable in the long term. In order to evolve and develop the Bitcoin system, the rules have to change from time to time to accommodate new features, improvements, or bug fixes. Unlike traditional software development, however, upgrades to a consensus system are more difficult and require coordination between all the participants. So let's talk about hard forks. Um, earlier, I talked about how the Bitcoin network may briefly diverge with two parts of the network following two different branches of the blockchain for a short time. Uh, that process can occur naturally as part of the normal operation of the network, and the network will reconverge in a common blockchain after one or more blocks are mined. There is another scenario in which the network may diverge into two chains following a change in the consensus rules. This type of fork is called a hard fork because after the fork, the network does not reconverge onto a single chain. Instead, the two chains evolve independently. Hard forks occur when part of the network is operating under a different set of consensus rules uh, than the rest of the network. This can occur because of a bug or because of a deliberate change in the implementation of the consensus rules. Hard forks can be used to change the rules of consensus, but they require coordination between all participants in the system. Any nodes that do not upgrade to the new consensus rules are unable to participate in the consensus mechanism and are forced onto a separate change at the moment of the hard fork. Thus, a change introduced by hard fork can be thought of as not forward compatible or in the non-upgraded systems can't process the new consensus rules after a hard fork.
So here's an example of a blockchain with forks. We've got a blockchain here with two forks. At height four, we've got a one block fork, which is 4A and 4B. This is a type of spontaneous fork we saw in our previous example. With the mining of block five, the network reconverges onto one chain, block 4B becomes stale and expires. Later, however, at block six, we have our hard fork. Let's assume that a new implementation of the client is released would change the consensus rules. Starting at block height seven, miners running this new implementation will accept a new type of digital signature. Um, let's say it's something that's not ECDCSA based. Immediately after a node running the new implementation creates a transaction that contains a, uh, the new signature and a miner with the updating software mines block 7B contain this transaction. Any node that has not been upgraded the software to validate that type of signature is now unable to process block 7B. From their perspective, from the old node's perspective, both the transaction that contains a uh, special signature and the block 7B that contain that transaction are invalid because they're evaluating them based on the old consensus rules. So those nodes will reject the transaction in the block and they won't send it to any other uh, blocks in the network. Any miners that are using the old rules won't accept block 7B and will continue to mine candidate blocks whose parent is block 6. And so in fact, miners using the old rules may not even receive block 7B if all the nodes they're connected to are also obeying the old rules and therefore not sending along the block. Eventually, they'll mine block 7A, which is valid under the old rules and doesn't contain any transactions with these uh, special signatures. And those two chains will continue to verge from this point. Miners on the B chain will continue to accept and mine transactions contain the special signatures, while miners on the A chain will continue to ignore those transactions. Even if block 8B does not contain any special signed transactions, the miners on the A chain can't process it because to them it's an orphan block as it depends on parent 7B that they don't consider that a valid block. So while a uh, software fork is a necessary precondition, it's not it's in itself sufficient for a hard fork to occur. And you know, using the term fork is somewhat complicated because there's lots of different types of forks. You've got forks for software, networks, mining, and, and blockchains. Uh, so in open source software, a fork occurs when a group of developers choose to follow a different software roadmap and start a competing implementation of an open source project. Uh, we've already discussed two circumstances that can lead to a hard fork in Bitcoin. It could be a bug in the consensus rules or a deliberate modification of the consensus rules. In the case of a deliberate change to consensus rules, there was a software fork that led to that hard fork. However, for this type of hard fork to occur, a new software implementation of the consensus rules needed to be developed, adopted, and launched. Uh, examples of software forks that have attempted to change consensus rules include Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, and so on. However, however so most software forks may not result in a hard fork. While a software fork is a necessary precondition, it's not in itself sufficient for a hard fork to occur. For a hard fork to occur, the competing implementation must be adopted and the new rules activated by miners, wallets, and nodes. Conversely, there are numerous alternative implementations of Bitcoin Core and even software forks that don't change the consensus rules and can consist on, uh, coexist in the network and interoperate without causing a hard fork. Consensus rules may differ in obvious and explicit ways in the validation of transactions or blocks. The rules can also differ in more subtle ways in the implementation of the consensus rules as they apply to Bitcoin scripts or cryptographic primitives such as digital signatures. Finally, the consensus rules can differ in unanticipated ways because of implicit con consensus constraints imposed by system limitations or implementation details. Conceptually, we can think of a hard fork as developing in four stages, a software fork, a network fork, a mining fork, and a chain fork. The process begins when there's an alternative implementation of the Bitcoin client with modified consensus rules created by developers. When this forked implementation is deployed in the network, a certain percentage of miners, wallet users, and intermediate nodes may adopt and run this implementation. 
A resulting fork will depend upon whether the new consensus rules apply to blocks, transactions, or some other aspect of the system. If the new consensus rules pertain to transactions, then a wallet creating a transaction under the new rules may precipitate a network fork, followed by a hard fork when that transaction is mined into a block. If the new rules pertain to blocks, then the hard fork process will begin when a, when a block is mined under the new rules. First, the network will, will fork. Nodes based on the original implementation of the consensus rules will reject any transactions and blocks that are created under the new rules. Furthermore, the nodes following the original consensus rules will temporarily ban and disconnect from any nodes that are sending them these invalid transactions and blocks. As a result, the network will partition into two. Old nodes will only remain connected to old nodes and new nodes will only be connected to new nodes. A single transaction or block based on the new rules will ripple through the network and result in the partition into two networks. Once a miner using the new rules mines a block, the mining power and chain will also fork. New miners will mine on top of the new block, while old miners will mine a separate chain based on the old rules. The partition network will make it so that the miners operate on separate consensus rules, won't likely receive each other's blocks as they're connected to separate networks. As miners diverge into mining two different chains, the hashing power is split between the chains. The mining power can be split in any proportion between the new chains. New rules may be only followed by a minority or by the vast majority of the mining power. Let's assume, for example, an 80-20% split with the majority of the mining power under the new consensus rules. Let's also assume that the fork occurs immediately after a retargeting period. The two chains would then each inherit the difficulty from the retargeting period. The new consensus rules would have 80% of the previously available mining power. From the perspective of the chain, the mining power is only declined by 20% according to the previous period. Blocks will be found on average every 12.5 minutes instead of every 10 minutes, representing the 20% decline in mining power. This rate of efficiency would occur until 2,000 blocks are mined, after which uh, the ratio would retarget it back to 10 minutes. The minority chain Mining under the old, old rules of only 20% of the hash power will face a much more difficult task. On that chain, blocks are now mined every 50 minutes on average. Um, and so the difficulty won't be adjusted for some time, um, maybe a couple months later. And at that point, then the difficulty would be adjusted uh, so you could get back to 10 minutes per block. Hard forks are seen as risky because they force a minority to either upgrade or remain on a minority chain. Um, and this is still, uh, we're still relatively early on into um, consensus software development. So just as OA, open source software has changed both the methods and products of software and created new methodologies, new tools and new communities, consensus software development also represents a new frontier in computer science for creating these new decentralized consensus algorithms. Uh, and so we see new development tools, practices, and methodologies emerge. Um, the risk of splitting an entire system into two competing systems is seen by many as an unacceptable risk. As a result, many open source developers of Bitcoin are reluctant to use the hard fork mechanism to implement upgrades to consensus rules, unless there is near unanimous support from the entire network. Any hard fork proposals that do not have near unanimous support are considered too contentious to attempt without risking a partition of the system. The issue of hard forks is highly controversial to the Bitcoin development community, especially as it relates to any proposed changes to the consensus rules controlling the maximum block size. Some developers are opposed to any form of hard fork, saying it's too risky. Others see the mechanism of hard fork as an essential tool for upgrading consensus rules uh, to provide a uh, clean evolution. Finally, some developers see hard forks as a mechanism that should be used rarely with lots of advanced planning and only under near unanimous co consensus. Um, already we've seen the emergence of new methodology, methodologies to address the risk of hard forks, uh, including uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 34 and Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 9, which have methods for signaling and activation of consensus modifications. So let's talk about soft forks. Not all consensus rule changes cause a hard fork. Only consensus changes that are forward incompatible cause a fork. If the change is implemented in such a way that a non-upgraded client 
will still see the transaction or blocks as valid under the previous rules, that change can happen without a fork. The term soft fork was introduced to distinguish this upgrade method from a hard fork. In practice, a soft fork is not a fork at all. Soft fork is a forward compatible change to consensus rules that allows non-upgraded clients to continue to operate in consensus with the new rules. One aspect of soft forks is not immediately obvious is that soft forks can only be used to constrain the consensus rules, not to expand them. In order to be forward compatible, transactions and blocks created in the new rules must be valid under the old rules too. Um, the new rules can only limit what's valid, otherwise they'll trigger a hard fork when rejected under the old rules. Soft forks can be implemented in a number of ways. The term does not specify a particular method, rather a set of methods that all have one thing in common. They don't require all nodes to upgrade or force non-upgraded nodes out of consensus. So here's an example. A number of soft forks have been implemented in Bitcoin based on the reinterpretation of a NOP opcode. Bitcoin script had 10 opcodes reserved for future use, uh, NOP 1 through NOP 10. Under the consensus rules, the presence of these opcodes in a script is interpreted as a null operator, meaning they have no effect. Execution occurs after the NOP opcode as if it wasn't there. A soft fork, therefore, can modify the semantics of this NOP code to give it new meaning. For example, BIP 65, uh, check lock time verify, reinterpreted the NOP2 opcode. Clients implementing BIP65 interpret NOP2 as op check lock time verify and impose an absolute lock time consensus rule on a UTXO that contains this op code in their locking scripts. This change is a soft fork because the transaction is valid under BIP65 is also valid on any client that's not implementing BIP65. To the old clients, this script containing NOP code is just ignored. There are other ways to do soft fork upgrades. The reinterpretation of NOP up opcodes was both planned for and an obvious mechanism for consensus upgrades. Recently, however, another soft fork mechanism was introduced that doesn't rely on NOP codes for a very specific type of consensus change. And this is explained in more detail in our section on segregated witness. SegWit is an architectural change to the structure of a transaction, which moves the unlocking script witness from inside the transaction to an external data structure, basically segregating from the transaction. SegWit was initially envisioned as a hard fork upgrade as it modified a fundamental transaction structure. However, um, they created a mechanism by which SegWit can be introduced as a soft fork. The mechanism used for that is a modification of the locking script of the UTXO created under the SegWit rules such that non-upgraded clients see the locking script as redeemable with any unlocking script. As a result, SegWit can be introduced without requiring every up node to upgrade or split from the chain. Uh, it's likely there will be other mechanisms by which uh, soft fork upgrades can be made in a forward compatible way. There are some potential criticisms of soft forks. Uh, one of the potential arguments against it um, is that um, because soft forks are more technically complicated than a hard fork upgrade, they introduce technical debt, a term that leads to increasing the future cost of code maintenance because of design trade-offs made in the past. Code complexity increases the likelihood of bugs and security vulnerabilities. Uh, validation relaxation, non-upgraded clients see transactions as valid without evaluating the modified consensus rules. In effect, the non-upgraded clients are not validating using the full range of consensus rules as they're blind to the new rules. Um, irreversible upgrades, because soft forks create transactions without, with additional consensus constraints, they become irreversible upgrades in practice. If a soft fork upgrade were to be reversed after being activated, any transactions created in the new rules could result in the loss of funds under the old rules. For example, if a CLTV transaction is evaluated in the old rules, there is no time lock constraint that can be spent at any time. Therefore, critics contain that a failed soft fork that had to be reversed because of a bug would almost certainly lead to loss of funds. Since soft forks allow non-upgraded clients to continue to operate within consensus, the mechanism for activating a soft fork is through miners signaling readiness. Majority of miners must agree they're ready and willing to enforce new consensus rules. To coordinate their actions, there is a signaling mechanism that allows 
the, the miners to show their support for a consensus rule change. This mechanism was introduced with the activation of Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 34 and replaced by the activation of Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 9. So BIP 34 provides signaling and activation. Um, it implements a consensus rule change that required the Coinbase data field of a Coinbase transaction field input to contain the block height. Uh, prior to BIP 34, the Coinbase data could contain any arbitrary data. Afterwards, valid blocks had to contain a specific block height, block height and specify a version number. And so um, this created a two-step activation mechanism based on a rolling window of a thousand blocks and a miner would sign signal his or her readiness for BIP 34 by constructing blocks with uh, the indicated two as a version number. And that way we'd be able, we'd know that the miners are willing to support it. The consensus rule activated in a couple steps. If 75% of the most recent thousand blocks were marked for version two, um, or when 95% of the recent blocks had were marked for version two, at that point, the version one blocks uh, would be considered no longer valid. And after successful signaling and activation under the BIP 34 rules, the mechanism is used twice more to activate other soft forks. After the activation of BIP 65, the signaling and activation mechanism of BIP 34 is retired and replaced with the BIP 9 signaling mechanism. So let's take a look at the BIP 9 uh, mechanism. So this is the current mechanism. Um, and again, um, it was, you know, this uh, BIP 9 was selected because BIP 34 had some problems. Uh, so BIP9 interprets a block version as a bit field instead of an integer, uh, and it sets a maximum time for signaling and activation, so miners don't need to wait forever. So it's essentially a timeout. Um, if it hasn't been approved in that time, then it's not going to be activated. Um, so proposed changes uh, under BIP9 are identified by a data structure that is gonna have the following fields. It'll have a name for the proposal. It'll have a block version to signal approval for the uh, uh, proposal. It'll have a start time. It'll have an end time for the proposal after which the change is considered rejected if it hasn't reached its uh, activation threshold. Um, so here's a look at a BIP9 state transition diagram to show you how this works. Uh, basically, proposals start in the defined state once the parameters are known uh, and defined in the Bitcoin software for blocks. Uh, after the start time, the proposal start state transitions to start it. If the voting threshold is exceeded within a retarget period and the timeout has not been exceeded, the proposal state transition is to locked in. Uh, and then one retarget period later, proposal becomes active. Proposals remain in the active state once they reach that state. If timeout elapses before the voting threshold has been reached, the proposal state changes to failed, indicating a rejected proposal. And then it stays in that state. So you either go to active or you go to failed, depending on whether or not you reach your threshold uh, before or after the timeout. So consensus software development continues to evolve and there's a lot of discussion on the various mechanisms for changing consensus rules. By its very nature, Bitcoin sets a very high bar on coordination and consensus for changes. As a decentralized system, it has no authority that can impose its will on the participants of the network. Power is diffused between multiple constituencies such as miners, uh, Bitcoin core developers, wallet developers, exchanges, merchants, and end users. Decisions cannot be made unilaterally by any of these constituencies. For example, while miners can theoretically change rules by a majority, they're constrained by the consent of the other constituencies. If the miners act unilaterally, the rest of the participants may simply refuse to follow them, keeping the economic activity on minority chain. Without economic activity, the miners would be mining a worthless coin with empty blocks. This diffusion of power means that all the participants must coordinate or no changes can be made. Status quo is a stable state of the system with only a few changes possible if there is a strong consensus by a very large majority. The 95% threshold for soft forks is reflective of this reality. 
of what's necessary to achieve consensus. It's important to recognize there's no perfect solution for consensus development. Both hard forks and soft forks involve trade-offs. For some types of change, soft forks may be a better choice. For others, hard forks may be a better choice. There is no perfect choice. Both carry risks. The one constant characteristic of consensus software development is that change is difficult and consensus forces compromise. So I wanna thank everyone for watching this lecture. Um, this lecture is available under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike. Uh, this slide deck contains content from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos uh, at github.com slash Bitcoin book. I wanna thank Andreas for making his content available under this license. Um, so this slide deck, this video, the GitHub and any other content based on these slides are covered by this license. So thanks again for watching uh, this lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett, focusing on Bitcoin's mining and decentralized consensus.